hello, everyone. Uh, first of all, thank you guys so much for joining us. We're incredibly excited to be here with you all today. My name is Leah Say, and I am the Assistant Manager of Public Policy Communications at General Motors. The Planck Center for Leadership and Public Relations works to support students, educators, and practitioners who are passionate about our profession by developing and recognizing outstanding, diverse public relations leaders, role models, and mentors, just as Betsy Plank did. Known as the First Lady of Public Relations, Betsy Plank attained leadership positions not reached by previous women, overcoming challenges along the way. Similar to the challenges Betsy faced during her 63-year career, the Center's 2017 Leadership Report Card found that being successful in the field is still challenging for women. The pay gap is real. The opportunity gap is real. And being heard and being respected gap is real. This webinar will discuss bridging those gaps, including action items for current leaders at all organizational levels, creating equal opportunities for communication professionals, addressing pay equity and the needs for mentorship, and shattering the glass ceiling. So with that, I would like to introduce you all to today's panelists. Julia Hood is the founder of Agenda Zoom, a brand of pop-up media, and a member of the Planck Center's Board of Advisors. Jackie McMahon is a Senior Assistant Account Executive in Ketchum, New York's corporate practice. Dr. Donalyn Pomper is a PR professor and endowed chair at the University of Oregon. Her research focuses on helping people maximize their potential at work. And last but not least, Brian Price is the Corporate Communications Manager for Starwood Retail Partners in Chicago, working across social media, website, email, and text messaging marketing for shopping centers. Now, as you all are listening, we encourage you to type your questions in the Q&A box that you guys can see at the bottom of your screens for our panelists, and we will answer as many questions that you have that we can get to at the end of the webinar. Also, for those of you who are on Twitter, we would love for you guys to tweet at us. So you can tweet at us at Plank Center PR using the hashtag, hashtag Plank Webinar. So with that, we will go ahead and get things started. And Julia, I will let you take it away. Thank you so much. I'm so pleased to be here. Thank you all for joining us today for what is a really important discussion on a really important day. I don't know how many of you are aware, but today is actually Equal Pay Day. Um, Tuesday, April 10th is Equal Pay Day. Um, it was originated this day by the National Committee on Pay Equity in 1996 as a public awareness event to illustrate the gap between men's and women's wages. Uh, and this of course, we know uh, that that effort endures. Um, if you look at the World Economic Forum uh, Global Gender Gap Report uh, 2017, they highlight how important the gender pay gap um, is to address for global stability. Uh, as they put it in the World Economic Forum, gender parity is fundamental to whether and how economies and societies thrive. Ensuring the full development and appropriate deployment of half the world's total talent pool has a vast bearing on the growth, competitiveness, and future readiness of economies and businesses worldwide. So they're not understating it, but they are uh, somewhat gloomy about how long it will take until we achieve ge uh, gender pay parity. Um, the latest estimate by the World Economic Forum was that it may take up to 217 years to achieve pay equity, which uh, seems extraordinary. But I'm sure that in our very enlightened advertising and communications markets, we can make great strides to this effort. So starting on my first slide, equity, what is our industry doing about it? Obviously, there are two very distinct parts of the equity um, story that we have to address, and they, and they connect in this effort. So the opportunity equity uh, to be hired, to be promoted, and to take leadership positions, and pay equity, which is obviously the fair and equivalent remuneration regardless of gender. Um, this era now, moving to the next slide, um, I think we're all aware that there is a, a greater sense of urgency around these topics. Um, the cultural movement around Me Too and Time's Up have found their way to the advertising and PR industries. And just as the conversations in that core, the, the spark of the Me Too and Time's Up movements have broadened from the criminal sexual misconduct uh, to uh, se sexual harassment um, and to, all the way to more conventional, um, not criminal, but the discrimination um, and the d enduring issues that women face um, in the workplace. Uh, these are not new concerns 
for our industry as they are not new to anyone else. On the next slide, um, WPP, because it is a publicly traded company in the UK, headquartered in the UK, uh, is in the unique position of having its um, gender pay gap very, very apparent because they're required to file uh, with the UK government, as most large companies are, um, what their gender disparity is if they, if they have one. So uh, the median 14% across UK WPP agencies is um, likely not atypical in other companies and other holding companies. It's interesting to note, though, that in the PR agencies, um, that actually was lower. Um, so the, the broad, there was quite a broad range within the individual agencies within um, within the WPP group. And moving on to the next uh, the next slide, uh, the 3% movement was uh, is 10 years old this year. Um, it started as um, a, an effort to uh, close the gap between uh, the number of female chief creative officers at the top of uh, advertising agencies. Uh, that figures, which was 3% at the time of, of launch, is um, now uh, entered double digits. It's 11% now, but still a significant amount of work to do there. Um, moving on to the next slide, um, Cindy Gallup has been a notable um, uh, critic of the advertising and broader marketing universe over the issues of gender equity and gender and equal pay. Um, last year, a year ago, um, before Me Too and Time's Up had really blown up, uh, she had launched a Facebook app uh, that was aimed at helping women uh, with their negotiating skills around, around uh, equal pay. Um, I, I point these out because they're very um, sort of uh, structured and predictable ways that uh, individuals have mobilized women around these topics and have brought women together to uh, try and address these these inequi inequities um, in the market. Um, but the way I have noticed the Me Too and Time's Up really playing out uh, in a new way in this era is uh, on social media. So uh, Diet Madison Avenue is a mostly Instagram brand that is completely anonymous. It's a, a group of uh, like-minded advocates for uh, gender equality. Uh, they're, uh, they've come under criticism as well as praise. They've gained a lot of followers by publishing um, everything from uh, accusations of individuals and improper behavior to uh, research and studies and encouragement and empowering type information as well. And it's gained a, a huge amount of popularity. And, and what's been very interesting is seeing how uh, this very, very uh, sort of underground, unnamed um, community has pushed the advertising and marketing industry that much further along. Um, I should also point out, by the way, that the PR Council uh, she quality effort as well, a community effort also launched about a year ago now as well. Um, and that's another one of those sort of institutional groups that was really tackling this issue. But now I think the difference that we're seeing now is the, the sort of grassroots uh, frustration bubbling up to the surface and pushing um, individuals along and pushing um, organizations along. Uh, in perhaps response to that, um, the advertising and uh, marketing industries, or certainly the agencies, have joined up with the Time's Up movement to launch Time's Up Advertising. Um, it has uh, numerous co-signers from across the industry um, to say that they support they support what Time's Up is doing, and it's time to bring this uh, this kind of scrutiny and this sort of expectation to the advertising industry and and PR industry as well. And Gail Hyman from Weber Shamrock is one of the co-signatories here, so there is um, some PR participation in this as well. Um, but again, that although that mobilization and that sort of uh, institutional convening and uh, tackling of these issues has predated this, I think we are in a new era of um, frustration where uh, the types of um, communication that we'll be hearing about this will be continuing to be um, quite aggressive and forceful and um, that people will be looking for results. So moving on to what can you and your company do? Uh, I think 
we know that there is an expectation in the workforce that companies will address these issues. If they're not being addressed in your in your organization now, then almost certainly uh, you will be challenged to address them at some point. Um, so participating and encouraging your staff to participate in salary benchmarks like those done by the professional organizations, PR Week, which is my former employer, the Holmes Report, it's very important. We need data. We need to understand what is the what is the landscape and where is the gender parity. So encourage your staff and, and you yourselves should participate in those benchmarking studies. There are successful uh, equity models in the industry where uh, agencies and organizations have made very, very serious commitments to this. We've mentioned some of them, PR Council, She Quality, Plank. Obviously, this is a key leadership issue for us at Plank. Um, but Andrew Public as well has a women's leadership network. So there's a, there's a commercial response. It's They're very public about a lot of the information, a lot of the data that they bring to that effort. Um, reviewing state laws and all laws that apply to federal employees only as they evolve around this issue and consider adopting those standards ahead of legal requirements. Um, some states require that employers or prospective employers uh, do not ask salary history questions during interviews. Um, this is a state-by-state state requirement. It is not a, a federal requirement. Um, but why wouldn't your company necessarily adopt that ahead of the legislation um, to show that you're not setting salary standards based on perhaps uh, artificially lower standards by another employer? Um, and there are uh, there is a federal uh, reg regulation uh, that federal employees are not to be penalized or fired uh, for sharing their salary information with each other. So uh, there is no requirement for pay secrecy, and transparency is everything. Of course, this is one of those things people don't like to talk about, how much money do I make? Um, but the more transparency we have on these uh, topics, um, the more likelihood we'll have of addressing them more quickly. Um, and then, of course, the professional associations, as I already mentioned. And um, I would uh, also, just moving on to the next slide, uh, is, is to express the ownership of this issue from the leadership level is, is really, really important. Salesforce um, very notably and very publicly um, grabbed hold of the gender uh, pay equity issue um, directly from the top. Mark Benioff, the CEO, um, went through two very, very significant rounds, and, and it's ongoing, as, as much of their documentation would tell you, um, to analyze and to close the pay gap. Um, and they've put their money where their mouth is. They've, they've paid out, and it took two two rounds of adjusting, um, salary adjusting, to to approach that um, pay equity. And they're not done. Um, this is not a, um, uh, as it says here, it is a moving target, especially for growing companies. It's a never-ending obligation to be monitored and discharged from year to year. Um, Salesforce has lots of documentation online available about this. Um, which is really, really interesting to look at. And again, it shows, um, and finally, that you, it's an, it is that ongoing process. Candor and transparency is the most important thing in establishing the trust. Um, without the trust that, that people are doing the right thing, um, it, it simply won't work. Um, and get help. This is, it takes a village on this. Um, industry partners, outside experts, and the executive team all can collaborate together. Uh, no one company is going to solve this by themselves. Um, I look forward to hearing any questions as we move on. Thank you, Julia. This is Jackie McMahon, and I'm thrilled to be able to participate in this discussion today. As Julia touched on a bit, I'll be talking even further about how we can each take action on an individual level by seeking out mentors, role models, and sponsors throughout our careers, which is a crucial step for women to achieve success, earn leadership roles, and continue pushing for equity. So an overview of women and mentorship with some surprising information. A 2013 study by Development Dimensions International, DDI, so not as recent as I had hoped, but had some really interesting findings from business women from 19 different countries, a number of different industries. Um, they found that 67% of women rate mentorship as highly important in helping to advance and grow their careers. Nearly 80% of women in senior roles had served as formal mentors. However, the shocking gap is that an overwhelming 63% of the women surveyed reported that they had never had a formal mentor. 
syndicates a huge development gap that so many women have never had someone that they view as a mentor. And it's critical here for growth and achieving those leadership roles. So we need to think through this gap. Um, according to the women who responded in this study, it isn't because they aren't willing to mentor, it's because they're not being asked. The majority of women, 54%, reported they've only been asked to be a mentor a few times in their career or less, while 20% additionally on top of that reported they had never been asked to be a mentor. And this is problematic, especially if we look at how women are already lagging behind male counterparts in mentoring. According to other research, men typically tend to seek an offer to mentor much more readily, while women are typically a little bit more reticent. They have to be sought out and encouraged more to be mentors. So in summary of that previous slide, DDI's data shows that women are willing to be mentors, but potential mentors aren't always seeking them out. Moving on to what does mentorship look like? It has a couple of different forms it can take. It could be formal versus informal. A lot of companies have formalized mentorship programs. I'm very fortunate that Ketchum has a global mentorship program where I have a mentor and also for the first time I'm now paired with a mentee. But even if your company doesn't have a formal mentorship program, many organizations do, especially within our industry, as Julia mentioned. Local PR essay chapters often have mentorship programs. I know New York and Chicago and many others do. But even beyond these formal programs where you submit an application to be paired with a mentor, a mentor can be a leader or a role model that you reach out to and you ask to be your mentor. Whether that's someone at your company or even another company within this industry, it's important to be building those relationships and building your network and your mentors. Clearly, the data shows women are willing to be mentors, but they may have not been approached. And even more informally than that, identifying role models inside and outside of your industry, even if they aren't people who you speak with regularly, that you can see their career path and maybe find goals for yourself from that. As Carly Kloss even said, who has developed amazing programs to help young girls learn to code, you can't be what you can't see. So having role models is a good way to identify some of those goals for your own career path and then reaching out when you can. Another crucial distinction here is mentorship versus sponsorship. I'm referring to both of them broadly within the term of mentorship, but there is a crucial differentiator here. Um, a CNN article clearly defined the difference as mentors are key figures who guide you through the working world. They're like the rarely seen guardian angels guiding your career and your life along. Sponsors, on the other hand, play another kind of role. They're the ones that are actively advocating for your next promotion or raise. They pull you up through the ranks of a company or an industry and make sure your name is brought up for opportunities. So this is crucial to have both mentor guidance relationship, but also be finding sponsors who can advocate for you. As Sylvia Ann Hewlett wrote in her book, Forget a Mentor, Find a Sponsor, the easy way to sum that up is mentors advise, sponsors act. But referring to that just generally within mentorship, it's impossible to truly achieve the goals that you're looking for without a mentor or a sponsor. And it turns out women on average have three times as many mentors as men, but men have twice as many sponsors. It seems like women are just not as intentional in their terms of in developing these relationships. So formal or informal, men or women, how do we seek out these mentoring relationships? The first step, which seems simple, is asking. As that study showed, people are willing to mentor but may have not been asked, may have not been approached. So there is a mentor guide on the Planck Center's website that provides helpful first steps, suggestions for finding a mentor, links to additional resources. It even contains some template emails, which you should definitely customize, but it can help you get started to even go about asking someone to be your mentor or to meet with you often, whether it's to seek advice or if you have specific goals in mind and you can start that relationship with those goals laid out. And like we say in the mentorship guide, do not be discouraged if the first person you reach out to to become your mentor is busy. That often happens, but just continue trying and seeking out these types of relationships. Barry Rafferty, the CEO of Ketchum, I reached out to her for a quote special for this webinar and she said, her mentors have taught her to be a little bit tougher, to not let the everyday ups and downs get to her, but to persevere and be a stronger leader as a result. This is very empowering advice from someone who is the first female CEO of a top five global PR firm. And Barry has talked a lot about how mentorship has been critical to her achieving her own success. 
And in a recent employee meeting, she also suggested asking for this type of feedback and relationships with both men and women. Even as women, we might be prone to seeking out counsel from other women, but men also have really different perspectives and approaches to situations, so it's important to seek counsel from both of those groups. On the other side, why should we be mentors? As mentioned, many men and women are willing to be mentors, but some do have some hesitancy. And the overall impression seems to be that this is a result of time. We're all so busy, especially in this industry, it seems like it will take up a lot of time. However, the DDI study revealed that of the women who were mentors, only 9% that mentoring takes time away from making progress in their own work. So as it turns out, once women make the commitment to being mentors, they find that the time it takes is not a burden to their own work and is truly rewarding. Instead, a lot of studies showed that one of the main reasons that women may be hesitant to become mentors is feeling like they have a lack of expertise within the this topic area, this number two statistic here of 54% of the women surveyed. But a recent analysis by the Harvard Business Review shows that especially once people reach the C-suite and these leadership positions, technical expertise matters much less than core leadership skills. In most mentoring relationships, mentees are looking for help with leadership skills, help navigating the business world, especially here in this context of women finding ways to work through workplace issues and navigating some of the experiences we can face in the workplace, having those salary conversations and working through negotiations, as well as other interpersonal skills and leadership development. The guidance and sponsorship that can be available through mentoring is critical to help women overcome some of these obstacles, find the support they need, and continue advancing their careers. So, to sum it up, don't be afraid to ask. Seek out mentors. Don't be afraid to reach out to them. And mentors, don't be afraid to say yes. And now I'll turn it over to Donalyn. Thank you so much. One of the areas that's been important to me in my own research in an academic environment is looking at the glass ceiling phenomenon, which we've been actually studying since the 1980s. And lately, I and some other important researchers in the public relations academic arena have been looking at how the work-home life balance issue further exacerbates the glass ceiling issue. Part of this dynamic, we cannot overlook the power of the cult of domesticity. And what this means is that women are socialized, girls are socialized to fulfill a, quote, female gender role. And historically, women have deferred to their husbands, quote, superior intelligence and physical strength. And this has dictated women's dress code, the ways that they behave, the spaces that they think they can occupy. And it creates dissonance among a lot of women who want to break out of that cult of domesticity to the degree that today women are told we can do it all. And I think that's true, but there are some barriers in our way. Um, I want to also emphasize that while this conversation is really important, it's, it's important to also recognize that often what we're talking about is primarily the experiences of Caucasian, middle class, white women. And it's important to recognize that the experiences of women of color are unique. So that's um, something that we often overlook in our research. Women have been slow to ascend, unlike Barry that we just heard about. There are so few women in the uppermost positions in the public relations arena. And often women are told that there are all kinds of things wrong with them, which I'll get to in a quick second, but we know from our academic research that the, working the second shift, working at home in the non-paid environment is only one variable. Public relations is attractive to so many men and women because it's perceived as being a flexible, family-friendly field because you don't necessarily have to be glued to your desk nine to five. You can be away from your desk out in the field working on behalf of your organization and your clients. And that means that sometimes you can navigate uh, some barriers that other folks in other fields experience. And that's a good thing. There's also the lure of a feminized field. Our students who are, who are with us as in the public relations programs across the U.S. and globally, actually, they like the idea that this field is, quote, dominated by women. They see that there are women who look just like them doing this kind of work. The problem is Women tend to only progress so far, and then they encounter that glass ceiling that I mentioned a moment ago. 
These are the women who are working very hard, have developed their skills to the degree that they're ready to break through that glass ceiling, but they're experiencing a lot of dissonance because they're trying to be perfect, perfect at work, perfect at home, and they're trying to have a perfect body. And as we all know, spending time at the gym and bicycling and working out outside takes a lot of time. And that's time that when we're in a crunch position, we take away from ourselves and give to our workplace or our non-paid work home environment. We also know from our previous speakers that women, uh, that men still out earn women and they advance more quickly in the field. And we find that highly frustrating and that significantly contributes to women's slow ascent on the management ladder in organizations. For decades, women have been told it's your fault. We call this victim blaming, claiming, uh, blaming. Women are told you're just too nice. And Cheryl tells us we need to lean in. In other words, it's our fault for not advancing as far as we want to in organizations. We're told you need to get more business experience. You need to get more finance experience. You need to get, take more leadership workshops. You need to get a mentor. You need to develop networks that are going to help you to navigate. And often women, especially those with children and families at home, whether it's uh, their own children or their extended family, their parents or their husband's parents, when they need to leave sometimes to take care of some of those issues, their commitment is questioned in organizations. And as we all know, that's quite unfair. Ironically, these issues are not new. Simone de Beauvoir in 1949 recognized this. She said, quote, one is not born, but rather becomes a woman. No biological, psychological, or economic fate determines the figure that the human female represents in society. It is a civilization as a whole that produces this creature. The good news is, in public relations, we have lots of studies to help us to navigate this issue. And in particular, there's plenty of work that suggests that the work-life balance is not necessarily a woman's issue, but that's how it's framed. And there are many of us who are working against that kind of uh, orientation. We know that there are key factors that are degrees, that offer degrees of organizational support. There are uh, issues that we need to look at. There are career path interruptions, such as women when women uh, take maternity leave, lots of gender issues associated with uh, the work-home life balance issue. Often women are the primary caregivers in their families, and this extends not only to their immediate family, but also to taking care of their parents, and in some cultures, taking care of their partner or husband's parents. This is further exacerbated by, particularly in the U.S., we live in what we call a workaholic culture. And I suspect that's why coffee shops are so important, because we're always looking for some caffeine to help us get some new energy to just get through the day. There's one study that suggests that our PRSSA students tell us that they expect it to be hard as a woman working in public relations. They expect this kind of conflict. And I, I find that uh, very uneasy, that rests with me very uneasily. We also know from our research in public relations that a negative work environment increases conflict, whereas professional support decreases conflict. So hats off to the Planck Center, PRSA, and other organizations that are helping women and men to navigate these important challenges. In my own work produced with Dr. Young in 2013, we conducted a survey among public relations, communication and management, and other professionals in advertising and marketing, we discovered uh, results to our first uh, hypothesis. Communication career workers report dissatisfaction with their communication career home life balance. This, was, this hypothesis was partially supported. And in fact, we found that about 81% of the respondents to our survey work in excess of 41 hours a week. So these are people who are in the trenches and can report honestly about their own experiences with career home life balance. 57% of them consider themselves to be the household breadwinner in their home. And nearly 43% of them are satisfied and 36% of them are unsatisfied with the career home life balance. In fact, 40% have actually considered leaving the field because it's just too hard to balance their paid uh, work outside the home with their non-paid work inside the home. Our second hypothesis was females who work in a communication career express higher degrees of dissatisfaction with communication career home life balance 
than their male counterparts. Interestingly, this was not supported. Even though women reported being more likely than men to consider leaving their communication career due to these challenges, the difference is not statistically significant. So what this means is it's not just a women's issue. The balance issue is an issue for everyone working in public relations. Our third hypothesis, communication career workers in a for-profit setting express higher degrees of dissatisfaction with communication career home life balance than their nonprofit counterparts. This was not supported. So we're sharing the wealth here. Everyone is experiencing challenges associated with home life career, uh, home life uh, balance. Our fourth hypothesis, communication career workers with families don't rely on their spouse or significant other to perform more domestic responsibilities. This was supported. And we suggest that the spouse or the significant other is just not helping around, helping out around the house. Or conversely, our respondents for this particular survey uh, collection, they think they can just do it all and they're not even asking for help. And that's problematic as well. Our fifth hypothesis, that communication career workers perceive that women with children tend to experience fewer career growth opportunities than their colleagues who don't have children. This was absolutely supported and there was no gender difference. Everyone agrees that this is a problem. Our eighth hypothesis, and this had uh, an opportunity for us to collect some qualitative feedback, Communication career workers report a permeable border between work at the office and work at home. What we discovered is that while we love our technology, we love our handheld devices, our computers, our phones, our iPhones, et cetera, we love all of that. But what it does is it creates a, a permeable border rather than a solid line border between our work at home at the office. And we have discovered from the qualitative responses that our respondents said things like, yeah, I take work home and I do it at home. And then there's the, or the numbers there, of how often they do that. And then at home, they're talking about work. And then at work, they're talking about home in ways that probably we've never done before because of our uh, technology and devices. So what does it all mean? What can we do? These are some action items to help maintain good communication, career, home life balance. Number one, collegiality. I'm very concerned about the experiences of women who tell me that uh, those with children are perceived by colleagues that don't have children as being slackers, and their colleagues then feel that they have to pick up the slack. And the mommy wars, a uh, popular culture uh, phenomenon a few years ago, told us all about this. And I think what we need to do is stress within the workplace how important it is to support one another. So that's that's very important to make everyone feel comfortable that there are differences among us in terms of work home life balance. We also look forward to organizations being more flexible in terms of the actual boss and with the schedules that our uh, public relations practitioners work. We also need to make sure our colleagues are able to work from home, but also have organizations that understand that sometimes it's just necessary to turn off the devices so that our public relations colleagues can enjoy their home life. That's very important to maintaining balance. So establishing those parameters is exceptionally important. I also think it's important that organizations really step it up in terms of creating on-site daycare at work. This is something that's been given a lot of lip service since the 1980s. And yes, some organizations are moving forward with this, but in my view, not enough. And then overall, we need a workplace culture that's very supportive of people who have families at home, whether it be children or parents or in-laws, because putting guilt on our colleagues is not the way to help one another to advance, and it's certainly not the way to help organizations to meet their goals. Okay, this is Brian. I'm going to jump in and shift the focus to men for a few minutes here and what men can do in today's environment and also what women can expect from their male colleagues. So we can go down to the next slide. Um, I want to talk about millennial men specifically at first. Um, and to do that, I want to actually uh, make sure that we're all defining the term millennials in the same way because I think there, there's a chance that millennials 
are older than you might think. Um, you hear a lot about this generation, um, millennials this, you know, millennials changing that, that type of thing. Um, and, and maybe what comes to mind is high schoolers or college students are maybe just some really, really, you know, first year out of college type of uh, colleagues in the in your organizations. But really, when we say millennials and when millennials are surveyed, uh, it's really more like the entire entry level professionals all the way through, you know, 38 year olds with significant experience management responsibilities, and in some cases, pretty significant organizational influence. So I want to talk about, uh, through that lens, the, the role that millennial men can have in, in the class ceiling. Um, what I found really interesting in, in doing some research for this was that millennial men and women actually have a lot of shared values, more so than past generations by a significant margin. You look at um, both millennial men and women rating diversity of race and gender very highly to produce great work. We look at both valuing inclusion, both socially and professionally, to create a, a very positive work culture. It, um, definitely, um, sort of maybe even a millennial stereotype um, that that certainly seems to, to live up to it by a lot of feedback. That, that I've heard, um, a hunger for opportunity to show growth and the ability for advancement, um, but also um, wanting the flexibility of work schedules, you know, the, the idea that certain days you could work from home or I can come, come in late certain days or leave, or leave early for a couple hours and then work later at night if I prefer this or that. Um, these are all things that both men and women of this generation value. There are also uh, many of those are, are things that, uh, as we've talked in our discussion today, uh, similar to to what women have always been asking for. So there's a lot a lot more people asking for the same type of of flexibility, the same kind of opportunity, the same kind of inclusion. And as you see, millennials making up 40% of the workforce, but climbing to 75% in 10 years. That's quite a bit. When we look at obstacles and challenges faced inside organizations, we also see a lot of overlap between millennial men and millennial women, too. This chart shows retention, which is often a key measure of a company's culture, uh, opportunities given to all employees, work-life balance, really just crucial issues like that that, uh, that are often tied to retention. We see here it's, it's a key issue for most women and most millennial men that we can align on that. However, you juxtapose that with men over 40 who are going to value, uh, not to say that they don't value retention, but when we force them to select and, and order things, you know, one through ten, retention barely cracks the top five on average. So uh, I, I look at this as another way that we can demonstrate how millennial men and most, for the most part all women are aligning on a topic um, and, and showing that this is, this is very important. Uh, you can go down to the next slide. It's got a similar chart. Um, and I want to take some more time actually here to, to really just let this concept, uh, uh, concept of shared thinking and partnership sink in. Uh, for me personally, child care is something that I know I re will really value someday um, and would place family leave, uh, family time, child care assistance. As, as was recently mentioned, you know, I would r rate that significant um, if it was something that was uh, provided or had some assistance through my work and through my office building. They would be huge for me when I have a family. Uh, women rate that, millennial men, um, similar to me, are all saying that. I'm a millennial male, I'm saying it. I think that it's just not something that was thought of by men 40 and older coming from a different environment. But now we're, we're sort of saying the same things here. And it's showing up in survey data and it's showing up in in organizations and how they how they are uh, evolving to to treat their employees. So why I say that is because it's more than just a women's issue right now. Uh, adapting to what me and my fellow panelists ha have said today, that what we've all talked about, um, it isn't going to be an option for companies looking to stand out. Adapting to this culture 
is going to be necessary to attract and maintain top talent. I want to, I want to just take a couple more moments to, to look at how this actually happened and maybe some rationale is why this came to be and how this, how this ally in millennial males uh, came to happen. Uh, looking at a, at a study from a, you know, a few years ago, but and, and it, it truly, it's, it, right, it's three statistics here. This is not the full story, but I did want to call out a few key key items on how women found such a strong ally in millennial men. 46% uh, of millennials reported their mother returned to work before they were three years old, double from the baby boomer generation, still significantly more than the generation X in between the two. Um, it's just it's something that a lot of, of people, either millennials, they, when they were children, they had both parents working, or if they didn't, odds are one of their friends did. So it, it was, it's common. It was just kind of, just kind of the way it was. Look at nearly half of millennials said that their mothers earned the same or similar wages as their father. Now, you know, maybe not everybody knows what wages their parents make, but the fact that they assumed even if they didn't know that, yeah, of course they'd be similar. That's the way it should be. I think that that's really interesting. And then those who, who were aware um, were, were reporting that as well. So you're, you're seeing a lot of this, it just feeling like it's the way it's supposed to be for millennials. And then when it comes to diversity issues, I think we inherently understand the why and why is this important. It is because that's the way it's supposed to be. And for the most part, you, you should see millennials being able to get that uh, pretty easily and gender equality being a, a, a crucial aspect in, in, that, in that campaign. So uh, we can go down to, to my last slide. Um, and stepping out of just millennial males specifically and going to all males, uh, I think a huge takeaway for all men is similar to what Jackie talked about a lot earlier in the presentation on the importance of mentorship. Uh, today's environment shouldn't be, should be, an, it should be an invitation to engage. It should not be an excuse to, to look at Me Too, Time's Up movements and say, this, is, this, is, this isn't for me. I'm going to retreat. Uh, I'm going to take this opportunity to say it's not natural. I'd rather not or, or withdraw completely. That really would exacerbate a problem that exists. So now is, is a fantastic opportunity to, for men to help all colleagues, especially female colleagues, um, develop professionally. Uh, otherwise, we're not playing a role. Uh, that, that's, that's really uh, a big part of how I feel about it. So uh, the simple takeaway is that company and departmental level leadership should be encouraging men to be mentors and resources for growth. And on top of that, men should be reaching out to their female colleagues. Um, it means more invitations to meetings, invitations to coffee or lunch, um, but to do so accompanied by concrete remarks uh, to a potential mentee's work performance. And when it's wrapped under that, it, it, it should be very, very respectful, uh, very organic. Maybe it's just one meeting. Maybe it's something that starts uh, a long-term mentorship or sponsorship, uh, as Jackie had mentioned earlier. But when, when it comes through work, about work, and so helping someone develop professionally, the, there should be no issues between men and women in a mentor-mentee mentor, mentor relationship. So I wanted to call that out, um, just simply touch on some of the issues that millennial males are, are facing and working through uh, wanting some similar desires as female colleagues and also what men of all ages can do to support women in this cause. Thanks, Brian, for that. Um, hey, everyone, again, this is Leah. Um, we'll just last, quickly, before we go um, into the Q&A portion, just going to go over some of the key takeaways from um, this webinar. And when I, when I look at this list of four bullet points initially, I think one of the things that I love about it most is that um, some of these bullet points really highlight um, some of the GM behaviors that we have here at General Motors about being bold, or we have a behavior that says it's on me and it talks about accountability. So I love that some of 
of these bullet points initially just stand out to me as action items and things that I knew that I can initially do uh, to work on to help improve some of these challenges that any organization could face. So when just looking at some of these key takeaways, um, pay equity is a process that is an ongoing, ongoing process that requires direct engagement with employees and, and industry associations. So I think you all pretty much got the picture over the course of the presentation, but these are challenges that everyone on every level can, can address. It's not just women, it could be men, um, but there are a variety of people at a variety of different levels that can really take action to help make positive change. Uh, second key takeaway, don't be afraid. Seek out mentors and opportunities to be a mentor. Uh, I think one of the things I like most about this bullet point is that it says mentors with an S and not just mentor. I get questions frequently from folks that say, you know, if I just have one mentor, is that okay? And I encourage folks to have multiple mentors I know personally in my life, I have a lot of folks that are um, that, that mentor me in a variety of different areas who all just have different um, skill sets and different um, types of wisdom to impart on me. So I would encourage you all to make sure that in addition to mentoring others that you're seeking out um, multiple mentors. Uh, that third key takeaway is just holding organizations accountable and valuing employees. And um, and the last one is just millennial women and men have similar work attitudes regarding diversity, inclusion, opportunity, and flexibility, which should improve the gender gap as they become more representative of the workforce. Um, so now that we've kind of discussed some of those key takeaways and started to wrap up the conversation, this is now the part of um, the, the discussion that's my favorite part personally because we get to hear from you guys as audience members. Um, so if you would, use your question and answer box at the bottom of the screen and also feel free to use Twitter using um, hashtag plank webinar as the hashtag. We've already started to hear from some of you guys. Um, so feel free to use that mm -hmm. chat box as well as um, the Plank webinar hashtag to go ahead and ask some of those questions. So I'll ask the first question, um, and you guys as panelists can just answer the questions however you choose to, and then we'll start asking some questions from, um, from the audience. So my first question to you all is to, I guess, initially to tag on to what Brian was discussing. Um, what do you guys think are some additional things that men can do to support and empower um, equality for women in the workplace, equality for all, but obviously for women as well. And anybody can, can jump in. This is Julia. Um, I can start. I uh, And I really appreciated the perspective about the millennial um, generation and and moving into these leadership roles and how they'll uh, foster a, a more openness and more like-minded goals. So uh, I do think those points were extremely well made. Um, and I, I think men need to um, continue to be very active in uh, attribution and um, be very, very um, mindful in meetings about um, the things that send messages to people about um, their place in the conversation, their place in the discussion. Uh, those, those are significant. And um, you know, if when you're when someone is is interrupted, um, and sometimes it's sometimes it's a hierarchy thing too. Uh, but 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 sometimes people are not mindful, and if somebody's interrupted to to redirect the question, you know, redirect the point back to the person who was interrupted. If someone's um, kind of advancing an idea, um, make sure that they're they're heard. Make sure, um, you know, be very very attentive to those those small points that happen in the day to day interactions that make people feel um, that they're not being well represented with well represented within the group. Um, and I, I think that's. It takes work to do that, so you have to be very, very mindful in in the interactions in the office. That's great. Okay, um, moving on to our next question, we had a question on Twitter that says, "What does mentorship look like?" So, can you guys elaborate on that a little more? This is Donna Lynn. Yes, I can elaborate on that. Mentorship has many looks, many faces, many, many um, forms. I have served as a mentor for a number of years, and I have been mentored for a number of years. Mentoring can range from just being someone who listens when a, a person has a, a problem. 
to actually helping a person to navigate their career in terms of coming up with a, a strategic plan. I have I have mentors who uh, for many years have just reached out and, and said hello to those who have called me crying because they're having a ter terrible time at work and they're not sure how to navigate something. And I've probably been less uh, amenable than some of my younger mentor, mentor, mentor colleagues that in asking for help myself. So I know that that can be very hard and I, I heard that in our uh, talk earlier today. And my advice to everyone is to just don't be afraid to ask for help because chances are you're going to be helping the person who's helping you too. It will make them feel good and they're glad to pass along any advice that they've, um, based on their experiences that they've had. That's a great answer. I want to chime in on that um, with, with something from, from my experience because I've had a, a lot of, of people mentor me uh, over time. Some of them have, have, have stayed, some of them haven't. So uh, a, a simple way that, that I like to look at, you know, who is a mentor to me is um, if I don't feel like I'm comfortable calling or emailing them out of the blue and saying, like, hey, it's me, it's Brian, um, I, I'm, I could use some help with this particular situation. If I don't feel comfortable doing that, then, then maybe they're not my mentor anymore. And, and that's okay that, that they were in 2013 and they're not now. Um, but someone, you know, is, is you – have hopefully uh, over time multiple mentors. You can just look at your situation and say, okay, I'm in this spot at work. I need help, and the best person to help me is someone who has you know, corporate communication experience and um, ha has made a ha has done a lot of media relations work. Okay, who who do I know that that could help me in this situation? And maybe it's not someone you said, hey, you're my mentor, or will you mentor me? Um, it, but it's someone who who has lent a hand or, or who has given you an offer. Hey, I'm available anytime. Like, well, now's the time. I need someone with your uh, unique experience to help. And if you're comfortable reaching out, then it's someone who could be a mentor to you, whether it's just this one situation or um, to to start and develop a longer term partnership. All right. Another question that we received um, really talked about how to be a change agent. So if you guys could touch on that, that would be wonderful. But the question referred to um, someone who might be aware that change needs to take place, and they'd like to know how they can begin to um, be that change agent and begin to help create um, a different culture that's more inclusive within their organization. This is Julia. Um, I I think uh, you know if you are thinking about change the organization, it's very important to start locally, meaning with your own team and your own interactions. Uh, so if you are uh, in the position of managing others, then really dealing with your own uh, particular. Uh, community and cohort within the organization first, and if you're being managed by others, um, then being very, very uh, purposeful and articulate about the the types of things that will give you a more um, enriching leadership experience. Because a lot of leaders want to do better, uh, but they don't necessarily have the roadmap for every single individual, and, and individuals often need different things. So. It's a, it's really a two-way street. So whether you're in the position of managing others or being managed by others, uh, it's about sitting down and having a dialogue about what are the objectives um, for the group and how how are we going to best meet them. Um, and that works uh, for either dynamic. Um, but it really starts on that local level and then demonstrating um, success based on, you know, the very achievable things within that, that group and the work that you're doing. So if you're, if you're looking to make change, look to make change, um, and it may be uh, down to 
who is who can we get to lead a project? Are we using the same people? Um, are we bringing new thinking into our planning? Are uh, are we um, re relying on the same systems? Have we opened up um, decision making to different types of people, um, or are we relying on kind of the the same the same leadership decision making structure? Um, and that can be a very very um, small tactical things uh, that start to open up people thinking differently about the, the ways that they're conducting um, the objectives for the business, but also just the tasks of the of the department itself. So um, it's start local. Um, it, it really is on a on a bigger scale. That's every every CEO has to start with their own leadership team. Um, it, it, no company can can affect change um, all at once. All right, and the last question we have is for all of the panelists. Um, if you could leave audience members with one parting thought about women in leadership in the public relations industry, what would it be? This is Donna Lynn. That's, that's a I'll really go, excellent go, question. Oh, sorry. <laughs> go ahead, Mike. I'll, I'll go first. Okay. Um, I'll just jump in by saying, you know, I covered a lot in the presentation, but I think it's really important that that everybody in this position has a ton of, of allies in millennial males uh, at the office. So start start thinking about how how it can how maybe it can be positioned as something that's beneficial for you know, all employees under 40 because we we all kind of want the same things, or at least a lot of them. I think you're on to something there. This is this is Donna Lynn. My my parting comment is one of inviting public relations practitioners, professionals to be insider activists within their organization. And sometimes it, if it begins with the millennials, that's great um, to persuade other members of the uh, management team to uh, jump on board with enabling people to achieve their maximum potential. In my view, that's showing social responsibility and it's so simple. Take someone to lunch. Let someone speak at a meeting, listen to their ideas, invite someone whom you wouldn't ordinarily have on your, your uh, campaign or your, your, your team to, to participate. It's so easy and it makes organizations stronger, richer, more profitable, use the business case if that's what's necessary, but act as an insider activist to make just those small things happen. And before you know it, the larger changes will uh, follow in course. Yes, and this is Jackie, just want to build on that because we are at such a critical point right now in our society, in our world, in our industry specifically. So let's just all think about what we can do to make the most of that and continue these conversations beyond um, the Women's International Day or Equality Day and making sure that we're continuing to push for progress. And uh, this is Julia. I would I would echo that as well and take it um, uh, as as well as a, a bit of a rallying cry. We're at a really interesting inflection point culturally. Um, this is a time to take advantage of the focus on these issues. The, I, I don't remember any time in my life, and I am a Gen Xer. Um, to when there has been such a convergence around these themes. So this is a time to get serious and take action. If there ever was, ever was in my lifetime, now is the time. And uh, I hope we've inspired some, uh, some people to try some new things. Wonderful. Well, everyone, thank you so much for choosing to spend your time with the Planck Center uh, and asking much needed and important questions about women and leadership and public relations. And I'd also like to say a special thank you to our panelists who were uh, incredible and added much needed insight to this conversation. And uh, feel free to note everyone that this webinar is going to be archived just as all webinars are archived on the Planck Center's website. So feel free to go back to it at a later time and share it with your colleagues and friends. So thank you all so much again and we hope you have a wonderful day.